mostly this program is going to be going through all those, all those pictures that I took for two and a half years. But I will also uh, want to read a couple things first, just to set the stage. The first thing I'm going to read sounds not very coherent. Okay? It's not my reading. This was the testimony of Jonathan Tennant, the pilot. And it was taken 48 hours after the, what they call the casualty. He had already, in this lengthy testimony, said that he hadn't slept for 48 hours, that he was in a great deal of pain, and he'd ask permission from the Coast Guard to stand up and walk around so he could you know, keep going. Um, so it's very much stream of consciousness, but I think it really tells exactly what happened from his point of view. Um, I'm leaving out a fair amount of love duplication. And I start to execute my turn as normal. The ship felt directionally unstable, meaning when I started the turn, she wanted to keep turning, more so than I'd normally expect. Yes. At least, and so, if she's not responsive enough, she doesn't crack enough, then I may say starboard 20. And he'll do it. And then if she responds, the midship may be the next order. She comes back to midship, then that ship just took off. And so I immediately put a counter rudder on. And when I did that, it was like nothing I had ever experienced in 21 years here before with a car ship. And it happened so rapidly that I was absolutely in disbelief. And the ship, at some point in the turn, I realized I didn't have a ship anymore. And I called Jamie on the radio and said something to the effect, I've lost her, watch out, go around. This was the oncoming car carrier. So the whole ship starts sliding, and I'm grabbing on. There's a binnacle ship about this high, and then the gyro repeater here on a gimbal. That's my compass, and I'm standing there, and the thing just, the ship just rolls. And that thing dove, and she went into the water, and it was just like a crash. And of course, I reflexively, I don't think my, I had fully processed that I'm on my side. So I still was looking at the inbound and still looking at driving the ship, but I'm giving commands like, because she was swinging to starboard, drop the port anchor. No, well, those people aren't there anymore. The radio is not working. The ship is blacked out. I'm giving full of stern. He said of stern, not apparently. You know I instinctively am giving commands that a pilot would give under crazy circumstances. But at the exact moment I was doing that, I'm not sure that I had the context that the water and propeller were already, already out of the water. Rudder and propeller, that was my mistake. Because it's like that, and all areas there's darkness and alarms. The only thing that worked on that ship after the capsizing were the alarms. So I grabbed the radio. Jamie, send me. Tell Moran I need the tugs as quickly as possible because I'm fearful I'm going to sink in the deep channel. And I know I got to get to the sandbar or everyone is going to die. I won't read the rest of it, but that is the gist of what happened. Um, the Coast Guard later found that uh, the ship had rolled because it was improperly ballasted. Uh, they blamed the first officer for not computing it correctly. Um, the secondary problem was that when they came under the Lanier Bridge, uh, they opened the pilot door, and so that si and that was the side the ship was falling to, so it flooded into the ship. That was what trapped the four men who were trapped in the engineering space. Okay. Um, they did get out, if you don't remember that. They were rescued, but they were there for three days and uh, they were trapped by the water that came in through the pilot door. Um, so you can see it was just, it was chaos, and it was very, very fast. This picture was taken at 9.17 in the morning, September 8th. You can see its first light. There's light on the bow there, the white section. Um, the ship was stopped and grounded, as the Coast Guard put it, at 1.40 a.m. Um, they called in helicopters from Savannah. All the tugs and a lot of and the Coast Guard boats in the area went out to try to help. As it turned out, they did ground on the sandbar. They didn't need to be pushed onto it. That was in later testimony. 
What you see here is essentially where it was for two and a half years. That's off the north point of Jekyll. This was the next day. Those two are the two Moran tugs, and if you're not familiar with them, those are the, the ordinary harbor tugs. Moran has a contract pretty much all up and down the East Coast, I believe, to provide tugs for the port. And these two were the port tugs that got there. They were holding the ship because no one was sure what was going to happen at that point, whether it would slip into the channel or not. Um, where you see those tugs, is where they went in to rescue the engineers. So four men were trapped, two men were trapped in behind glass. One of them got out ahead of the water, but he couldn't get any farther than where the rest of the engineers were. So you had three men in, in a, who were in one space. Adjacent was this one man behind some very, I guess, unbreakable glass. Um, this was the second day. I don't think they had yet realized they were alive because um, they didn't know for sure until they heard banging. I think they were going around banging on the ship trying to hear them. Where they went in to, whoops, let me get back here. Where they went in to try to rescue them is right there. Um, they, brought, they brought in a great number of boats and various rescue operations, including some people who specialized in rescuing people from tall buildings because they had to rappel down. Uh, they eventually cut a hole there, and I don't have a picture of that. They cut a hole, they managed to pull the three men out, they finally got down in this space and got the fourth man out. Now, once that was completed, it was no longer the Coast Guard entirely in control. So <coughs> you went into the second phase of this operation. This is when the contractual salvage operator, Don John Schmidt, brought in their equipment from New York. Um, those are some of their boats. Uh, they were, this was mid-September. This happened on the 8th, so we're talking maybe 10, 11 days later. Uh, they were staging to do things they hadn't started yet. Uh, this was from St. Simon's Pier. This is how, how it looked then. You might want to remember the nice level line at the top. It had not tipped over yet. You'll see what happens as time goes by. Um, this is what they required. Well, the port was closed for five days. Um, there, after it opened, the Coast Guard, which is the port commander, required that, sorry, keep playing, that a tug accompany each boat in and out. And they only could go one way. Uh, when the accident happened, there was an incoming car carrier, and they were planning to pass right in front of St. Simon's Pier. That's the Jamie he, uh, that's the Jamie he was calling and saying, watch out, I'm on my side. Um, this, uh, this is one of the first ships that came in. This was a pollution control vessel. Um, NRC Liberty. NRC is a National Recovery Corporation. It is all over the world, including Alaska, and they specialize in oil spills and things of that sort. You can see the yellow boom that they were carrying with them. They were here until at least after Christmas of 2019. This was one of my favorite little boats that was here early. That's the porta potty boat. <laughs> So at this period, we're still in September going into October. What was going on was first there was a fairly major oil spill. Uh, it took them a while to discover that there was something open under the water. They had to send divers down to weld, weld the, uh, that closed and that stopped the original oil spill. But while that was happening, they had all of these pollution control vessels were going around. This is how they initially tried to keep oil out of Clam Creek. Uh, it looks pretty good in this picture. You'll see later what the problems with their engineering was. <laughs> they, they didn't think this thing through, or they didn't realize how much tide there was going to be. It looks great there. Didn't stay that way. This is the first major operation 
These again are Don John's people. Once they got that leak under control, they were lightering. Lightering means to get the oil out. And so these vessels here, and you can sort of see that yellow pipe that's going diagonally there. That's, that's how they were pumping oil out of the, out of the vessel. Um, and they did that for several weeks, I think, um, and carried it. My understanding was they took it into Brunswick and they were able to separate oil and water and save a lot of the oil. Uh, this is another example, I just happen to like this picture too, of how they were forced in the early days to take ships out of the harbor. They were afraid that if a ship lost power, had a problem going around the wreck, it would crash into it and make things a lot worse. That was why the Coast Guard insisted that there be one tug accompanying each ship as it exited or entered. So in the usual pattern is that the Moran tugs will meet a car carrier or a regular ca uh, cargo carrier, which is what this is, uh, on the other side of the Lanier Bridge. And with the car carriers, they essentially turn them around to back them into Colonel's Island. Um, they do that sometimes with the, car the cargo ships, and they take them up East River. Uh, but they don't go out to meet them at sea. But for about a year after the wreck, um, the Moran tugs were escorting them all the way out till they hit the channel. Now you can start to see what was going on with that boom down at Clam Creek. Okay? And they had people there constantly trying to fix it, trying to pull it, trying to make it work. Um, I mean, at least twice a day, somebody was there working on it. That's what it really looked like um, <laughs> a lot of the time. Really bad idea. Um, they didn't really get that fixed until after January when they came up with a really good plan. We were very fortunate. We did not have oil going into Clam Creek. Uh, I asked one of the Coast Guard men at one point why, uh, why we, uh, where the oil was going if there were leaks, and he said primarily into the port. And it had to do with the, with, right, it had to do with the currents. And so uh, if they had a leak, it would mostly go all the way into the port or come back out. And so we were spared to a large extent. Um, St. Simon's got pasted, got their rocks painted up once, but that was about it. Um, just for pretty, I just like that ship. Uh, but again, that's Moran Tug. And where the lights are, I think, is where the pilot door is. Um, but they had, it <coughs> they had figured out to keep it closed, I think, at that point. Uh, this is another Moran Tug right behind one going past the fishing pier at night. Um, and they weren't mostly, except for that one instance, I never, they weren't pushing these big car carriers. I mean, it would be like a chihuahua chasing <laughs> you know, a St. Bernard. It, um, Although I was told that they're so powerful that they could, in fact, have easily kept them off the wreck if they lost power. This was all um, this was always this was basically what was going on into December. That's why I did that. I want to check the date. Uh, not a lot was happening towards the end of 2019. Um, we had. We had constant, um, the little boats were chasing around. Um, all those little boats were based under the bridge. They were zooming back and forth. The porta potty boat was out there all the time. They were checking all the shores for pollution. But the only thing that was happening on the wreck um, towards the end of 2019, after they'd lightered off most of the fuel, was um, here, if you, and look closely, they've already removed the back ramp where the cars go in. They also had removed the propeller, which is here. And the propeller was then cleaned up and dumped out to make more of Gray's Reef. And I think the ramp went there too. Um, this was pretty much the last thing that Don John Smith did. Things got very quiet for a while. Uh, there was some argument and potential litigation in the background. Um, the, the owner 
wanted to hire somebody else. They took the position that it was now a wreck, not a recovery, and they had the ability, they only contracted with Don John Smith for recovery. And at this point, it was a wreck. It was a different proposition. The Coast Guard agreed with them, and so essentially by the, begin, the end of December of 2019 and the beginning of January 2020, uh, they hired TNT out of uh, Texas, um, Humboldt, Texas, I believe is their headquarters. Uh, this is one of the Don John barges leaving. It was early January. So they moved out, and there's TNT coming in. Now, the interesting thing is, if you notice, those boats that Don John was using were huge. I mean, they had these big proprietary tugs. They were all painted their company colors. They were twice the size of anything else you know, that was being used. And uh, TNT had a different business plan. Their business plan was to stay fairly small and then contract with other people to provide the services they needed when they needed them. So this particular barge and some of this stuff was brought up from Jacksonville. Um, that that uh, tug, by the way, I don't think I'd want to be the captain of that tug. Its name is the Termite. I have no idea why somebody thought to name it the Termite, okay? <laughs> but um, it came around a fair amount. But they were moving in in early January. Now, here's some of TNT stuff. You look at the Look at the line now of the, what the side is doing. It's tilted over 10 degrees or more. Um, there's, on the earlier pictures, you can't see that ramp there. It's just flat. It's taken from the same place on St. Simon's Pier. So when you, when you get here, all of a sudden you have a, boat, a, a ship that's collapsing towards St. Simon's. Uh, more, of it, more of it's visible. It's certainly looking a lot less neat and clean. And it's been out there about four months at that point. This is, this is early Jan uh, mid-January. Another ship. This one was just a cargo carrier coming in with Moran. The, whoopsie daisy. That's the Moran tug and there's the Golden Ray at, under the bridge. Now things started moving when this happened. These are the posts, the pipes that they used to build the containment area that they ultimately um, put around the ship. Um, so this was one of the first loads that was coming in. And I can't explain this one. I kind of wondered, because there was litigation going on. Don John was trying desperately to hang on to the contract. And it sued everybody. Well, it sued the Coast Guard. It didn't include, sue the owner. It sued the Coast Guard. And I must admit, I had my suspicion that this might be a, you know, their SEAL team or something going out to try to seize the boat. But <laughs> nothing came of it. Um, the litigation was kind of wild. Um, it made the news here. They filed a, mostly against the Coast Guard commander in the area, the port commander. And they accused him of doing it all wrong. But their basic allegation that they made was that there was going to be imminent damage, environmental damage, and they asked for an injunction. And they went before the federal court here in Brunswick, and they got a hearing. And they showed up at the hearing and didn't put any evidence of imminent damage to the environment. Five months later, they quietly dismissed the case. I think, pure speculation, that what happened is that since Don John is out of New York and they were, um, had probably a joint venture with Schmidt, which is a big international salvage company, that they got their signals crossed a bit on what they wanted to do. And so the initial complaint is not maybe not what the joint venture decided to do in the end. I don't know. Made, made huge news. They were trying to stop the transfer to TNT. Um, didn't work. Now, this is when they actually finally started moving. This, we're talking February at this point. This ship uh, is something called the Brazos, and it has living quarters and supplies and workspace. And it was here while they were building the... Um, 
see the containment there? That's the first, some of the first posts we're going in. This little pat, this was here from March until the end. This is the Pacific Horizon. It was the biggest crane that they had until a huge one came in at the very end to cut up, help cut up the ship. It's the Pacific Horizon stayed here, and you'll see it later helping dismember the ships. Now, here we are, and this is April, April of 2020. So we are at this point a few weeks into the quarantines and the crisis, and everybody's going to die of COVID and that stuff. They decided to try working at night to speed things up. Uh, this was the first night work that they did. I saw that they were going to do it. I went out to the pier, got a night picture. Um, they had it really lit up. Um, the, big, the tallest crane there is the Pacific Horizon, which was on the barge, and there's some others there. Um, they tried very hard. Uh, this was a Weeks Brothers barge. Um, Weeks Brothers hired two or three barges to them, crane barges to them. They came down from New York. Again, the business plan was to make a bunch of contracts, not to own all these ships. Um, this again, you can see in the, on the side there, I hope, um, right over there, they've, they've started to get a fair number, a fair amount of the enclosure built, getting the pipes in. Now, this is... This is May 2020, so it's still working pretty hard. If you notice, those are the lifting gears, and I don't know if everybody knows what those were. A lot of you do, I think. They were individually constructed, uh, welded pieces of metal that then were attached to the VersaBar crane to lift pieces up after they cut them. They were all individually designed depending on where it went on the ship. They got into some real difficulties because they weren't all being built at the same place. And so some places had problems shipping them, some places had problems completing them. Um, but it was you can see here, it's almost done. They've got pretty much all the way to the bow. Um, still working on it. That's the netting that they put between each of these um, posts. It looks pretty small, but each of those squares is five feet square. I believe it was made in Erie, Pennsylvania, and I think it was made out of that same strapping they tow airplanes around with, um, specially made. And they happened to be able to get a picture of it because in the daylight you couldn't see it. But with, with this kind of lighting, you could actually see what it was, and they were lowering them down between two two sets of posts. And that was the VersaBar in July. It was taunting us. It came, that was as close as it got. I, this is taken from Ocean, uh, Ocean View, yeah. And it, we knew it was around. You could see it on marine tracking. It was circling around in the water. And this is as close as I, I believe this is as close as it got to Jekyll. Next thing you know is down in Fernandina. It was a terrible picture, but you could see it as the light was, you know, it was getting light. Um, it never came back until October, okay? So from July to October, this is what you saw. Well, if you were out that time of the morning. Um, all of the lifting ears were on and they closed down. Uh, the official statement they, they made, they had a press conference, they talked about it. The reason they closed down, they said one of their crane operators had become ill, and I guess they're hard to replace. Uh, they were concerned about COVID, they were concerned about quarantines, they just, you know, they had too many problems. And so they put it on hold until October of 2020. So we're at that point, when they started up again, we're a little over a year from the wreck. In the interim, besides being you know, pretty to take pictures of, um, what they were doing was those little boats were zooming around, the porta potty boat was zooming around, uh, they were checking for pollution. And that's pretty much all they did, July, August, September, October. Yeah. 
Th this is the Kurt J. Crosby. This is when they started staging again in October. That is the biggest tug that was here. It was huge compared to the others, probably twice the power of some of the, some of the even the larger ones that came in. Uh, it's also out of Texas. Um, you can tell, I think, if you can see the size of this thing, if you can see that those are men standing there. Yeah, I'm assuming, say, say those guys are six feet tall, you know, that's a big ship. Boat, I guess, technically. Um, it's a bit foreshortened, this was with a long telephoto lens, so. Um, it came in and it put down anchors for the Versabar so they could anchor the Versabar over inside the enclosure and over the wreck. And there it comes. As we need music at this point, you know, da-da-da-dum. Uh, early one morning, with the sun behind them, they made quite an appearance. There were a lot of us down there on the beach watching it. Um, yeah, Kathy was down there. We had chairs. Well, some people had chairs. I think we were hoping it would be over sooner, so we didn't take chairs. Um, and they came in. Now, the, the tugs that are pulling it, I'll go back, go away. The tugs that are pulling it, you can kind of see there, there's one and there's one there. There were three of them with it. The one that's there looks huge, but it's about half the size of that Kurt Crosby. Yeah, the Kurt's huge. Um, and there we go, this is the Alaska Navy, one of them. We have a small Navy based in Anchorage. Um, this is the Bear Cub One. I can, I'm sorry my Inuit is lacking, I can't pronounce the actual name. Uh, there's Bear Cub One and Bear Cub Two. And they came zooming past the pier one day. I was in shock, because if you look at it, that's not meant for warm weather. Look at that ship. I mean, that is for northern seas. It's completely enclosed. It's got high sides. Um, this is one tough boat. It was made in Seattle as, as its companion, Bear Cub 2, and they are oil field services boats. Uh, there is actually Nanook. You remember Nanook of the north? There is a big one. They're all down in Louisiana, so I'm assuming that they're leased out because they're owned by one of the North Slope Native Corporations, which is not that easy to find out, but I tracked it down because I, I couldn't believe that name. I knew what I was looking at. Um, you'll see them several times, partially because I have a soft spot for them and partially because they were really doing a lot of work. Um, they had a boom, they have uh, well, here's what they were doing. Look at that one. This was pretty common. Uh, here, I think, they were, they were pouring solvent of some sort onto an oil slick in, in that containment area. Uh, and that's a lot of what they did. There was usually one out there, you know, all day. Um, later, they were used for other things. Now, here we finally got smart, okay? This is how Clam Creek was protected by the time they started working in the end of 2020. This boom is anchored. It stayed put. No matter what the tide did, it worked very well. You know, it stayed there. It was very handy. You'll see that it was actually appreciated by wildlife. Um, and then, so that's a big change from all that yellow stuff tangled up with the, the bridge. These boats, there were two of these. These are debris trawlers. They're specially built. They look like giant, clean fishing boats. Um, they're built to look like that. They're built as trawlers, but the idea was that they would be picking up debris from the um, water. They expected a lot of debris as they cut. Um, I, they only stayed here about six months. I, I really suspect they didn't work out weren't as needed, shall we say. They just disappeared, and they disappeared before the ship, the last cuts were made. So for whatever reason, they decided this wasn't something they needed anymore. But they were pretty. That's what I meant when I said some of the wildlife really liked the boom. I actually have a series of pictures where that particular egret managed to just bend over, pluck a fish, 
you know. He, he was fishing from there. He thought this was great. And I saw him get a fish. <laughs> so anyway, here's the ant. Finally, a month after the versibar came, that's the first cut. And they, you'll notice that they tend to do this stuff at night. <laughs> I got a lot of practice in nighttime photography because I'd go out there, oh my gosh, they they finished the cut, they've lifted it. In this case, what had happened, this was the bow section. They had cut it off, you can see the gap, and they had lifted the lifted it up and they had moved it out. And they were moving towards the um, what is that? The right. Um, and there comes the barge, also at night, sneaky. Uh, that's the Julie B. That they thought, this is supposedly the heaviest, uh, the barge that can hold the heaviest load of any that is registered in the United States. It typically, it's Crowley barge, it typically is used on taking drill rigs to the North Slope and things like that. It's been to Alaska many times. Um, and they were taking it by the fishing pier, headed out to collect that piece of the bow. In the dark, of course. And there's the bow loaded on the Julie B, headed into Brunswick. Now, the plan changed a fair amount. Um, the initial plan, if you look at that, oh, we'll go back, right there, they had provisioned for a second piece of the, of the ship. They intended to take the Julie B in, cut another piece off, and load the second piece on, and take them both down to recycling. Recycling, uh, the contract for recycling was given to MARS, which is Modern American Recycling Services, and that's Gibson, Louisiana. They recycle drill rigs. They fix ships, they do whatever. They've been in business about 50 years. Um, so here's Crowley. It didn't work that way. This, oh, this is the interior. This is what the first cut looked like. This is the bow piece. This is what you saw. From, that was from Mary Ross Park, and that was, I mean, it was full of, full of cars, okay? Things changed. They, they decided that wasn't the best plan, but this is, this is the first bow piece cut off and what the interior looked like. And that's what they were pulling out. I mean, that JCB looks like you could set it down, you know, turn the ignition and right, right off with it. It, it. it had been at that point over a year out there. You know, we're talking October, late October. And the ones that were above water apparently looked great. Um, so they were trying to disassemble you know, take those, take the things out. This is what, well, the way they gave up. They decided, even though the second supports are there, they didn't attempt to put another piece on because it was just taking too long. I, there's about 10 days to take it by barge down to uh, Gibson, Louisiana. And um, they just decided that, as far as I can tell, they didn't issue any press releases on this, um, that there was no point in waiting. So the Julie B took off and it was being towed. What the pattern was, it, went, it would leave the port with three tugs. You can kind of see Kurt's smokestack back there. This is, I think, Caitlin there. And this is Crosby Leader. The one in front is the one that tows it to Louisiana. That was, the, they took them out that way every time they took them out. Took them out with three to get around the wreck and then they unhooked two of them, which came back to port. Now, there we are, bow's gone, hey. And in this picture, you can see actually what the Versabar was doing. They have it over the second, where the second cut has been marked. They have lowered those two, I'm not even sure what you'd call them, huge you know, pieces of metal that they, they hooked to the lifting ears. Um, and I think they're actually cutting in that picture. It's a little hard to tell. Um, but that's, that was what we, would, we saw for quite a while um, with, with it over one end or the other. 
Now here, it's cut, it's cut the, the second piece off. And when it was getting ready, this is, this is the stern section that's been cut off. When it's getting ready to be put on a barge and go into Brunswick to the property that Mars rented along East River, and they had rented and leveled a whole section there, um, just adjacent to the cargo port. Um, you see the Kurt is pushing a barge. You can't really see it pushing, but that's what it's doing there. They, this is lifted up above the water. They slide the barge under, they put it down. They temporarily um, support it. They haul it into Brunswick. They get it ready to go out to sea. A lot more supports. And they tried to lighten it up. This is, now this one, again, this is the stern. This is what it looked like. It seemed to be a few less cars, but you know, they're sticking out every which way. And that's, you can see it's the stern because you can see where the ramp was. And that's how they were taking them in. Again, they had to have all these tugs to be sure they wouldn't lose control of it. Plus all these pollution control boats were zooming around to make sure it wasn't leaking oil. Um, and this went on for eight pieces and a little bit more. This is the site basically we saw for the better part of a year. Um, it just got a little bit smaller every once in a while. But this is what it looked like for a long, long time out there. This is when they started to change the plan. The chains that you can see on the sides there, like that, marked where they were going to cut. Um, I think they had already started using welding welders to try to make it a little easier to get the cut started. And they were cutting with welding torches along those chains. In addition, they had brought in, ultimately, I think, two of these little blue machines, Fuchs materials handlers from Germany. Well, designed in Germany. Um, what their advantage was they could sit on a barge and reach in 70 or 80 feet and pull something out level. They weren't having to lift. So you could go in and go back out. And that's how they started getting a lot of the cars out. Um, so while they're working on the, at this point they were still trying to cut the engine room, which turned out to be a big, big problem. And so they were lightening what they could get at with this device, which is the, the second number two, which is the piece behind the bow. Now here, they had pretty much given up on the engine room <laughs> for a while. That, that, that was a nightmare. They, they, did, they did get it eventually. But they, they went back, and since they'd already lightened that second piece number two, they cut that, and they took that in. And, yeah, I, I, I can't remember, I could look it up, but I, I remember which piece that was. But you can see how much of the interior is gone on this compared to the first piece they realized that these things were just too heavy. Uh, the other problem they ran into is once they started cutting the ends off, you had a whole bunch of silt and sand that were getting into the portion of the ship that was underwater. And so they were getting extremely heavy. They had to deal with that. This was one of the earlier ones where they, I think they were still just, I think this is the stern, but maybe not. Uh, they were dealing with that piece. And there's still little cars looking like little swallows in a nest there. Um, here they finally got the stern after a long, long struggle and um, had managed to cut that. But what, what you can see there is they realized they had to get rid of the silt. See, those boats that can shoot water were very helpful. So they were, instead of spraying anti-pollution stuff, what they were doing was spraying out the silt. And they'd started, you know, once they got everything they could pull out, they got the fire hoses going on them, essentially. And they were back checking the shore. And I spent, as you can tell, a lot of time down in this area, and I think, I think only once did I smell oil pretty strongly. And it was going past the pier, I don't know where it went. Um, but we just did not have much coming here as they were afraid in the beginning. Uh, this is right off the parking lot at, 
at the pier. Uh, they parked a lot of the barges down there when they weren't using them. And here we go, another piece lifted. And they're pushing, the, pushing under there to get it. And pulling it in. This is the engine room. And this one was heavy. It, 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 the problem was all the steel and all the, the, it was a very protected portion of the, uh, the ship. And they finally got through it. Um, I could see when that was. That was April. So the first cuts, um, the first cuts were made, you know, the first cut was the end of October. They got the bow off. It wasn't until April that they managed to sever the engine room. And that's another picture of the engine room, just showing all the structural problems that they had trying to cut that. And in this picture, the Kurt is taking, because it was so heavy, the Kurt's the one that took it to Louisiana, as far as I can tell. That was on its way out. Then comes May. <laughs> yes. It was horrible. I mean, I, I was out there. I tried to, this picture I tried to take from the pier. You couldn't stay there. It was chemical fire. It smelled horrible. I didn't want to breathe that stuff in. Everybody was trying to get off the beach. It was so nasty. Um, this was from the other side. This was from over by the villas where you could actually see a little bit better. Because the wind was blowing pretty much directly at our fishing pier. Um, but you can see that the poor Versa bar is still attached. They couldn't, they couldn't get it loose. Our flames, it was hot, it was burning. There's nothing I could do. What started this fire, if you don't remember, was welding torches. Um, it, it hit some of the cars that were still in there and they got fire. Um, so they, were, they had been trying to cut those lines for the, for the cable, but um, I don't, it was quite a while till they got, were able to actually detach the Versa bar, till it cooled down enough. This, is, this actually shows pretty well what they were trying to do, and this went on for several days. It was every, every boat they had that could spray water on the thing was doing it. And um, apparently, at this point, the fire was down at the stern end of it, mostly. So that's where the water was going. The Versa bar, as you can see, is still, is still attached. You know, that, those... Um, Cross pieces are right down on, on, the, on the boat. Um, that went on for quite a while. They had to, and there's what it looked like after the fire. And you can see the damage that fire has done to the structure. Um, that's the Kurt coming back from New York. I never found out exactly what they did, but right about that time, the Kurt made a very fast trip up to the area of New York, turned around, came back. I'm guessing it brought equipment of some sort. It was probably the fastest way to go and get it, um, you know, and bring it back, you know. And now this was one of the last pieces coming out. This was probably piece number three from the front. Again, they like to sneak them out in, the, you know, early dawn from what I could tell, which was fine with me. But um, at this point, they had, they'd given up on the barges they couldn't rent anymore for the moment. So they, were ta they, had, they had three dry docks, floating dry docks that they had brought in. And back there, it isn't terribly visible in this picture, um, is the structure of this, the back portion of the floating dry dock. It's like a flat thing with a structural, you know, like a building. Um, that's the dry dock. And that's that piece going out. This was one of the bow pieces and you can see all the fire damage. So that was headed into Brunswick to be cut. Um, still, it was in fairly good shape. The, the hull was intact. Um, you can, you can't, I can see it well. I don't know how much is coming through on this screen. The supports had something to push on. You see, when we get to the middle, the last couple pieces were very damaged. And they had a lot of trouble with them. But, but here we're still picking up pieces that were solid. So when they lifted them, they didn't fall apart. And nobody cared, you know. <laughs> hey, you know, if you're fishing, <laughs> they were perfectly happy. Um, yeah, you know, I don't care what that is going by. Maybe the fish will like it. 
Uh, this was the last cut, okay? This was the end of August 2021. Um, they were getting ready, they hadn't attached it yet, but they were getting ready to cut the last two pieces apart. Fortunately, they waited while I was up home. <laughs> that's, the, that's the Alaska range. Yeah, it was, they had to deal with frost and ice. <laughs> no, that was a very pretty fall day in the Alaska range as I was visiting, well, visiting family, but had driven down to Anchorage. <laughs> So, but I have been accused of actually paying them to not finish the cut till I got back, but I don't have that kind of money. So, and there it was. That was about the day I got back. They had got the last piece up on the Versa bar. That's the last little piece there off to the side. So there they were. Yeah, and people are just sitting there fishing, whatever, you know. Uh, this one was taking that piece into port. Now, this is the last two pieces were the two center pieces, and they were the ones that they had a lot of trouble with all from the whole beginning because they were basically ero the, the water had eroded the sand they were on around the center, and so they were kind of teetering on this thing. And um, I, I didn't go into it, but they were trying to throw down rocks. They were trying to do it on everything to try to keep more erosion from happening. That is the effect of the erosion. See, there's a whole bunch of deck plating missing. So when they lifted it up, they found, uh-oh, we don't really have a bottom of this ship. Uh, they put it on the dry dock. They, they had to hold it up for a long time to get those supports so they could actually place it so it wouldn't just fall off the dry dock. Um, and secure it to get it into Brunswick. Now at this point, they've already got two other pieces sitting in Brunswick, okay, um, that were the adjoining pieces, um, also on dry docks. So what they decided to do was they decided to take the two pieces that were in better shape take them back out to the Versa bar, hook them up again, lift them up, get a barge under them, get the dry dock out, take the barge back to Brunswick. And there comes the Julie B again, okay? So there she goes. And this is the first of the better pieces. I don't know if this is one, two, three, four, maybe four and six, I'm not quite sure which ones they were. Um, and this was coming back on the Julie B. They still, and that's what, at this point in time, you can see how much they had cleaned out. Um, this was cleaned out in Brunswick from this picture. It doesn't show too much, but it wasn't completely cleaned out. They got it in Brunswick, they really ripped its innards out. And they were taking the Julie B and that piece back to the Versa bar because the Versa bar, and you see there wasn't much left, the Versa bar was lifting the last piece. So finally, they put both of them on the Julie B, lowered it down. And if you look closely at this, an awful lot of this is chewed up and they had, you know, because that's, that's what was on the bottom of the sound at that point. But they got both of them on, they got them secured, and that tug is the Zion M. Falgott. I have no idea why it's called that, but it was some man by that name, I'm assuming. Um, and that's what took them down. Now at that point, TNT was largely done. They had cut the ship, they had put them on barges, they had handed them over to Mars to go to Louisiana. Everything was good except for those pieces that were on the bottom of the sound. This was interesting. This is, you can't see it real well, but if you ever looked at Marvel comic books version of Thor, there's a painting of him there. This is the Thor. It's huge. I'll show you, compare them. This was brought in by Mars 
Thor brings Mars, Mars brings Thor. They're mixing their gods up here, but at any rate, they brought it in, and you can see how many tugs it took. Um, there was an interesting thing. that Moran tug there was not... Oh, go back. The Moran tug was not actually with it when it came into the, around the corner and down into the channel. It's that red one. But... I, so I was standing there, all of a sudden, one of the Moran tugs came, comes out from the port, does a U-turn, and catches onto the side. So I'm thinking that the pilot said, I don't have enough tugs to control this barge. You gotta get me another tug. And so out comes one of the harbor tugs, hooks on, and by the time it was going, this was just past the fishing pier, by that point, you know, they had it under control. It may be the currents were bad that day. Uh, they just thought, it, it's very obviously pretty top heavy. This is, um, this, is this is getting the last piece off, um, up and off and off the, um, yeah. And there, there you can really see the damage done by the water. Uh, the last two pieces, oops, that's not bad. The last two pieces stayed in Brunswick and were dismantled by Thor and Pacific Horizon and a whole bunch of welders. Um, they were down on East River. Uh, this was one of the last pieces going in. Um, and there was the Versabar ready to go. It left that afternoon. You can see its equipment isn't tied anymore to those big eye bars or whatever it was they had there. Um, and it was just sitting there ready to, ready to go home. Well, ready to go to Veracruz, Mexico, which was maybe not a good move. Um, the huge one there is the Thor. The one on this side, blue and white, is the Pacific Horizon. And you can see they're starting to chop up those pieces that were there. Uh, the last two that they were so damaged on the bottom. Um, the, the fancy looking blue thing there, okay? That was here for the filming of the Black Panther movie. Had absolutely nothing to do with this. <laughs> even, though it, even though it is for this type of, I th it looked like they might be coming in to fish those pieces off the bottom because that's the type of work it does. But I guess it got a nice contract from the, from the movie people. And so it came in for a couple of days. You couldn't get anywhere near it. I mean, they had security guards everywhere. And, uh, and it stayed there, and then it left. Um, there goes the Versabar. It was almost a, a year to a day from when it came in. So it cut everything up in essentially a year. Um, it was sort of going on an ill-fated voyage because it got itself, it was next job was in the Gulf of Campeche, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, off Mexico where it ran aground because a tow line broke. And it was aground for over a month. Um, it's loose now and it seems to have a job down there. It, it's, you know, it's still in that bay. But uh, it was in a mess for a while. They even had uh, the Mexican army out guarding the beaches because it was so close to the beach that you could easily have gotten to it. And uh, so they didn't want people going out. This was, this is just about the end for Mars. Mars was chopping things up. Um, this is where they were down across, the rail railroad tracks go down Bay Street there. And you know, the two, you can see at this point, they've, they've made a lot of progress. We're into December. 2021, and um, they are um, just about done. And there we are. That is the end. That's the last large pieces leaving. And they went down to Mars, and they've cleaned up, and there's nothing down on Bay Street anymore, and they've dug out everything they could in the water. So that's it. <laughs>